Today, we're going to go ahead and talk about the patient who presents with biliary problems. This is going to be your patient who presents with right upper quadrant or epigastric abdominal pain. So let's go ahead and get started. To begin, we'll go ahead and review our anatomy. We'll first start by labeling all the organs. So we have our liver, we have our gallbladder, we have your pancreas, and your intestines. Next we'll go ahead and label all the ducts. So we have our hepatic duct, our cystic duct, and these two ducts combine to form your common bile duct. And here we have our pancreatic duct, and our biliary tree drains into the intestines through the sphincter of OD. Let me go ahead and try to fix that, make it more legible. Alright, that didn't work. Uh, let me try to erase it and then rewrite it. So the first thing that can happen is your patient can develop little gallstones and these stones can get stuck at the neck of the gallbladder intermittently and cause pain. But as long as there aren't any signs of active inflammation or infection, this is called symptomatic cholelithiasis. Now, if your gallstone ends up getting into the cystic duct and actually becomes lodged there, you can develop all types of problems. So the patient could have now gallbladder wall thickening, sludge, pericholecystic fluid, and on exam, especially with the ultrasound, you may be able to elicit a sonographic Murphy's. Your patient now has acute cholecystitis. So again, to review the findings consistent with acute cholecystitis, you'll be looking for gallbladder wall thickening, sludge, pericholecystic fluid, And finally, a Murphy sign. If the stone makes it all the way to the common bile duct, your patient now has cholelithiasis. Because the stone is in the CBD, what you'll find is common bile duct dilatation. And all of your bile will actually take the path of least resistance and head back up into the liver. So these patients will often have elevated LFTs. Of note, most of the time with cholelithiasis, the gallbladder won't be as inflamed because most of the biliary substances are going back into the liver. So as a result, you won't have any of those inflammatory changes that we saw in acute cholecystitis. Finally, if your gallstone makes it all the way to the pancreatic duct, your patient may develop inflammation of the pancreas, which is known as gallstone pancreatitis. So these are patients that have elevated lipase, and when you do the right upper quadrant ultrasound, you see that they have some gallstones. Now that we've gone over symptomatic cholelithiasis, acute cholecystitis, cholelithiasis, and gallstone pancreatitis, we should now spend a minute talking about the treatment strategies for each one of these. 
For symptomatic cholelithiasis, again, this is the patient that has gallstones that intermittently get stuck at the neck of the gallbladder and as a result cause pain, but they don't have any evidence of acute infection or anything to suggest acute cholecystitis, cholelithiasis, or gallstone pancreatitis. These patients you can treat symptomatically and try to get adequate pain control. If you can get their pain under control and they can tolerate PO again, you can go ahead and refer them for outpatient surgery. If the patient instead has acute cholecystitis and they have evidence of gallbladder wall thickening, sludge, pericholecystic fluid, and a positive Murphy sign, well in that case uh, this is an emergency and you actually need to begin to treat them. Start with normal resuscitative efforts with normal saline. Make sure your patient's NPO. Go ahead and order IV antibiotics. And for the antibiotics, you want to cover gram negatives and anaerobes. So we generally use ceftraxone and flagyl. You will also want to get a stat surgical consult. For cholelithiasis. You got to get the stone out of the CBD, otherwise the liver will continue to sustain injury. In order to do this, you'll want to get an ERCP. So depending on where you practice, that could be a GI consult with inpatient internal medicine admission, or it could be a stat surgical consult. So you'll definitely want to go ahead and check with your hospital as to who does the ERCPs. Also, given that this patient most likely will not have signs of inflammation or infection of his gallbladder, these are patients that you generally do not need to give antibiotics to. The caveat, of course, would be if they present it with signs of sepsis, such as with fever, elevated white count, etc. In those patients, you'll want to start antibiotics. Finally, for gallstone pancreatitis, it's the same thing, you got to get the stone out of there. And in order to do that, you'll want to go ahead and coordinate for an emergent ERCP. Again, these patients generally do not need antibiotics unless there are actually signs of infection, um, as we discussed with cholelithiasis. If your patient does have a fever or elevated white count or other signs of infection, then you will want to go ahead and start them with antibiotics. The last thing that we'll talk about will be the patient who presents with cholangitis. These patients tend to be extremely sick and need emergent intervention. The classic triad that you're expected to remember is Charcot's triad. which consists of fever, jaundice, and finally right upper quadrant abdominal pain. Reynolds pentad is Charcot's triad plus altered mental status and hypotension. Like I said, these patients are extremely sick, so go ahead and start aggressive sepsis management with IV fluids and pressors if necessary, and go ahead and start antibiotics. You'll want to go ahead and call GI so that they can perform an ERCP and surgery to perform an acute cholecystectomy if necessary. And that's it, so thanks for watching, and hopefully this will help you the next time you have a patient who presents with right upper quadrant abdominal pain and biliary problems.